Hello, and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the story of Marlene Olive. Marlene Louise was born on the 15th of January 1959 in Norfolk, Virginia. Her mother, Jeanette Ellen Etheridge, was 19 years old when she gave birth to Marlene, having fallen pregnant during a short affair with a Scandinavian sailor who was on shore leave. Jeanette's family kept the pregnancy a secret from those around them and Marlene was put up for adoption. James and Naomi Olive had met in 1944 and married soon after. They longed to have a baby but were unable to conceive. On the 16th of January 1959, they adopted baby Marlene when she was just a day old. Naomi had been living with mental health issues for some time which were exacerbated after she became a mother. She became increasingly paranoid that the baby was going to come to some harm and would excessively sterilise everything that Marlene would come into contact with. She insisted that anyone that went near the baby had to wear a gauze mask and as time went on she became increasingly reclusive. At the same time James was struggling to hold down the job so when he was appointed as a marketing executive for Teneco and Gulf Oil the family moved to Ecuador setting up home in the second largest city Guayaquil. They had a good standard of living a lovely home and the assistance of household staff. However, Naomi was deeply unhappy and started to drink heavily. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoia. Unfortunately, James's response to his wife's mental illness and alcohol abuse was to simply pretend that it was not happening. As she grew older, Marlene would often suffer at the hands of her mother's illnesses and the relationship between the two became very distant. James tried his best to avoid the situation, telling Marlene that she just needed to be well behaved for her mother. Marlene became very close to her father and would often stand in for her mother at social events. At the age of 10, Marlene found out that her parents had adopted her as a baby and she began to question whether this was the reason that her mother did not appear to love her. In 1989, when Marlene was 14, James lost his job in Ecuador and the family relocated to San Rafael in California where James decided to set up his own business. This involved him working long hours away from home, leaving Marlene and Naomi alone together. Marlene was struggling with the change in lifestyle brought about by the move from Ecuador to the US. She was enrolled into a state school in Terra Linda where she found it difficult to make friends. Marlene and Naomi continued to argue and with Naomi's descent into alcoholism and untreated mental illnesses, these arguments became much more frequent and increasingly abusive and violent. This lifestyle took a physical toll on Marlene and she was diagnosed with a stomach ulcer at the age of 14. However, instead of treating the underlying problems with her health and life, Marlene was prescribed both tranquilizers and sleeping pills. She began to misuse her prescription drugs and then began dabbling in illegal drugs. She finally developed a group of friends, many of whom were regular drug users. She became increasingly interested in glam rock the occult and witchcraft. As Marlene rebelled, the arguments with her mother increased still further. With little ability to handle the situation, James tried to agree with Naomi, which led to Marlene feeling isolated and alone. No matter what, she had always had her father to depend on and it now appeared to her that he was taking sides. When Marlene was 15 years old, she bought some drugs from a 19-year-old man by the name of Charles Riley. Charles, who was more commonly known as Chuck, was the oldest of three children born to Oscar and Joanne Riley. Chuck seemed to have a happy start in life, but as he went into his teenage years, he suffered from severely low self-esteem, not least in part to him being very overweight. By the age of 15, Chuck weighed over 300 pounds and was prescribed dexedrine to help him lose weight. 
However, he started to misuse this drug in order to gain energy, which then led to him experimenting with other drugs and then move on to selling them in order to fund his own supply. Chuck had dropped out of high school when he was 17 years old and had drifted between jobs, being a bartender, a pizza deliveryman, factory worker and delivering newspapers. However, his main source of income came from dealing illegal drugs. He began collecting guns and was reported to be a skilled marksman. Chuck, who had never had a girlfriend, became besotted with Marlene from the first time that they met. Despite Marlene being put off by Chuck's size, he continued to pursue her and would shower her with both attention and gifts, often in the form of free drugs. Chuck became motivated to lose weight, all the while pursuing Marlene. Eventually, the two began a physical relationship. Marlene's parents, unaware of Chuck's main source of income, approved of this apparently polite and responsible young man who was dating their daughter. Chuck became increasingly obsessed with Marlene and she began to control every aspect of his life. If Marlene didn't get what she wanted, she was threatened to break up with Chuck. She reportedly would often beat him and bite him. She carved her initials into his shoulder and encouraged him to carry out her sexual and criminal fantasies. Friends of the pair stated that Marlene would refer to herself as the High Priestess who had ultimate power over Chuck, even carrying a tarot card to signify her dominance over him. Chuck remained anxious to please her and would do whatever Marlene told him to. On two occasions, Marlene broke off their relationship and both times Chuck tried to take his own life. After recovering, Chuck would beg for forgiveness and the pair would reconcile. Marlene would often speak openly amongst friends about how much she hated her mother and how she wanted to kill her. She decided to act upon these urges. Mixing together a large quantity of prescription drugs, she added them to Naomi's food. However, when Naomi tasted the meal, she said that the food tasted bitter and refused to eat it. In early 1975, Marlene and Chuck went on a prolonged shoplifting spree. Over a period of several weeks, they stole around $6,000 worth of merchandise from local stores. It's the equivalent of almost $30,000 today. They were eventually caught and charged with grand larceny. With news of his arrest, James and Naomi's opinion of Chuck immediately changed and they forbade him from coming to their house or ever seeing their daughter again. However, the relationship continued in secret and it wasn't long before Marlene started to talk to Chuck about killing her parents. On Saturday 21st of June 1975, Marlene and Naomi had yet another heated argument. Marlene snapped, she couldn't take it anymore. She telephoned Chuck and told him to get his gun as they've got to kill the bleep today. The missing word is also known as a female dog. The pair made a plan. Marlene would go shopping with her father, leaving one of the doors unlocked so that Chuck could enter the house and kill Naomi. Chuck, carrying a 22 caliber revolver and high on LSD, entered the house at 353 Hibiscus Way, Terra Linda. Naomi was sleeping on a daybed in her sewing room. Chuck then allegedly struck her in the head with a hammer before stabbing her and then finally suffocating her. When James returned to the house, Chuck was still inside the sewing room. James, seeing his wife lying on the bed covered in blood, grabbed a knife and lunged at Chuck. However, Chuck fired four shots, killing James instantly. In the aftermath of the murders, Marlene and Chuck took her parents' money and went shopping, grabbed something to eat and went to see a movie. When they returned to the house, they decided to dispose of the bodies. Wrapping James and Naomi in sheets, they went to a local hangout, China Camp, where they put the bodies in a barbecue pit with logs and gasoline, then set them alight. Two days later, on the 23rd of June 1975, they enlisted the help of a 17-year-old friend, Deanna Krieger, to assist them with cleaning up the sewing room. They admitted to Deanna, along with several other friends, that they had killed Marlene's parents. Marlene and Chuck continued to live at the house. 
They planned to wait until Marlene's parents were declared dead, collect the life insurance money, and then start a new life together in Ecuador. After a few days, James' business partner became concerned when James hadn't been seen or heard from and decided to contact the local police. The police visited the Olive House and spoke to Marlene. As she was an unsupervised minor, she was taken into custody where she started to tell a string of conflicting stories about what had happened to her parents. She told the police that her parents were taking a holiday at Lake Tahoe, that she had no idea where her parents were but that she knew in her mind that they were dead. She also said that her father had killed her mother but then changed this to say that her mother had killed her father. There was even a story where she told the police that both of her parents had been killed by Hell's Angels. Chuck was arrested and immediately made a detailed confession as to how he had killed both Naomi and James, but he continued to maintain that it was Marlene who had made him do it. The barbecue pit at China Camp was examined and fragments of human remains were found. Naomi and James were identified through two fragments and gold crowns. Marlene then changed her story and said that Chuck had acted alone and after the murders had held her hostage, forcing her to take drugs. Chuck and Marlene were tried separately for the crime. Chuck, who was 20 at the time, was tried as an adult, while 16-year-old Marlene was tried as a juvenile. Chuck was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and if found guilty would face the death penalty. His trial began on 30th of October 1975. During the trial, a psychiatrist testified that Chuck's love of Marlene was so excessive that it was a mental illness. Despite Chuck's initial detailed confessions, he changed his version of events slightly. He admitted to stabbing and suffocating Naomi, but said that she had already been beaten with the hammer and was dying a painful death when he arrived at the house. He stated that he had previously lied about this in order to protect Marlene, who he claimed had bludgeoned her own mother with the hammer. Chuck admitted shooting James, but said he was acting in self-defense as James was coming at him with a knife. After a seven-week trial, the jury found him guilty of both charges and on 26th of January 1976, he was sentenced to death. As the death penalty was read out, Chuck remained emotionless. Once Chuck's trial was completed, Marlene's hearing began. At the hearing, she was charged with violating Section 602 of the California State Welfare and Institutions Code. This charge covered any crime committed by a juvenile from the most minor of crimes up to and including murder. The court ruled that she did encourage, instigate, aid, abet and act as an accomplice in the murder of her parents. However, whilst it was clear that Chuck had murdered James, it was unclear as to whether it was Chuck or Marlene who had actually killed Naomi. Marlene's hearing lasted just two days and she was sentenced to a term of four to six years in a juvenile detention facility. She was scheduled to be released on her 21st birthday unless it was determined that she had not been rehabilitated in which case she could be held until she was 23 years old. The results of the two trials gained a great deal of media attention due to the huge disparity in the sentences received. Due to changes to the Californian death penalty statute, 11 months after Chuck was sentenced to death, the sentence was deemed to be unconstitutional and was reduced to two concurrent life sentences with the possibility of parole after seven years. Meanwhile, Marlene completed her sentence at the Ventura School, even being allowed to complete part of her time outside the school, living with a young woman who had been a juvenile services volunteer. Just a few weeks before her parole, she escaped and moved to New York, where she became a sex worker. She was arrested and returned to California, where she completed her sentence, and she was released in 1980. In 1981, Marlene visited Chuck in prison. It was the last time the pair ever saw each other. Whilst Chuck continued to apply for and be denied parole, Marlene moved to Los Angeles and changed her name. She was arrested on numerous occasions, charged with various forgery and drug-related crimes, 
and has served at least an additional six prison sentences of various length since her release from the juvenile detention facility. In 2011, 30 years after Marlene's release, Chuck appealed his latest parole refusal on the basis that there was no evidence that he continued to be a danger to the community and that his sentence had been unconstitutionally excessive. He was granted a new hearing and found to be suitable for release. However, this new ruling was subsequently overturned by the then Californian governor, Jerry Brown, on the basis that Chuck had never fully accepted his role in the murders and continued to downplay his involvement. Again, Chuck appealed this decision and it was overturned by the California Court of Appeal for the First District. Chuck was released on parole on 8th of December 2015, having served 40 years for his part in the murder of Marlene's parents, a crime for which she served less than five years in a juvenile detention facility. Thanks very much for listening to that story. Today's story was suggested to me by Kevin Stibich back in April. As usual, please add any comments down below. And now it's time for petty crime. First up, Tracy has sent in a picture of her lovely cats. Mandy is her first kitty. She's two and a half years old. And then next up, the tuxedo cat is her brother called Dweezel. He is always blurry in the photos because he never stays still. And when Tracy goes out to work, Mandy and Dweezel plot their next heist in their hideout, which is under the kitchen table. Next up we have Marcia Baker who has kindly sent in some pictures of Sugar. Sugar lives in South Carolina and is 12 years old. He got his name because he is sweet and has never used his murder clause on anyone. Thanks for sending them in Marcia. Thanks very much for listening to the crime reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Just a small favour, I'm trying to work out how many subscribers listen to this end part of the videos. If you do, please could you add the word subscribed in the comments below. As ever, thank you. Goodbye.